Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Adi and today we have another team report from the Vancouver Regional Championships and I am joined by another top player. I am joined by Brandon. How are you doing? Pretty good. Happy yourself. I'm, I'm doing real well. Uh, I'm excited to hear about one of the coolest teams to come out of uh, the Vancouver Regionals uh, and you've been working on similar teams for a while but this one is, is especially spicy so I'm, I'm excited to hear all about it. But first before we do that, uh, for those who don't know you, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Brandon, uh, known as one of the more of the size spam strongest soldiers kind of thing. Uh, down in based in like so SoCal, California, playing in their very interesting metagame down there. Um, been playing VGC for probably about two, two and a half years since about COVID started and been playing ever since. And I mean, so far the season's gone pretty well for me, so I can't complain. Yeah, you've had a really strong run. I know you top cut Portland Regionals, and now with with a similar type of team um, that also had the Indeedee Gallade Size Spam, uh, and now here you are cutting another regional, getting top eight with uh, Indeedee Size Spam. So tell me, what? Why did you start running this style of team? So even going back all the way to Series One, I've always been running a Size Spam core. I haven't been a huge fan of Hard Trick Room Size Spam. I've always liked to have a dual mode thing. And back when I played in Portland, uh, it was hard trick room because I was like, it seems like a good call for the metagame. Not many people were prepping for it since the balance with Entei and stuff were rampant. Um, it seemed like a really good call. And then fast forwarding to when we got to Vancouver, I thought, man, I'm really loving hard trick room, but it just has some really hard matchups. And a lot of those are some of the really prevalent um uh, teams that are in the format at the moment. So I was going through different teams. And I saw this uh, Japanese style team, so I thought I would try it out. Yeah, uh, and it worked out really well. Um, so, so what parts of the team did you take from this uh, from this Japanese team? So there are five Pokemon from the original Japanese team. The Ndidi, um, Gallade, and the Iron Crown are all there for the size spam mode. Uh, the Ursaluna and the Ogre Pond were both there as well. Or uh, Urs Ursaluna and the Iron Moth were there. And actually, it wasn't the Gallade, it was the Ogre Pond Water. So the Gallade was the new addition I had for the team. Since I've always liked having dual modes, and the Ursaluna felt a little weird without Trick Room, like a guaranteed Trick Room mode, because Trick Room on and DD is not always the most consistent. Um, I thought instead of having the Urshifu Dark, which was originally in the slot, I'd rather have a Gallade to keep the fighting coverage, but also give me a better Trick Room mode, so have that dual mode uh, synergy. Yeah, makes sense. And of course, you got the comfort. I know you ran that. Uh, a lot of the same Pokemon at Portland Regionals. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess uh, the Gallade uh, looks like looks like just about the exact same set too, right? Right. Yeah, so... Um, so talk me through. So you said you got the ga you had the other five Pokemon from this Japanese team that looked very similar to what you were running for most of the format, um, and you had this Gallad that you really liked, and you put it on, um, and that's the story. That's how you got the six Pokemon. Did you ever consider changing anything before the tournament? Um, I originally thought these original six seemed really good, but you know, like I said, I always liked having more of a consistent Trick Room set. So the Gallad was something I really liked right from the start. I did think about a Hattering mode so that I have a better like Psychic Spam mode. So I have two Psychic Spammers with the Iron Crown with Expanding Force and the Hattering with Expanding Force. But however, um, having both Wide Guard, because Wide Guard always felt really good for any team in general for me. And having uh, fighting coverage, because fighting coverage goes so well, especially into dark types like Ping Lu, um, even some things as other dark types like Incineroar and Chi Yu, it helped a little bit uh, better in those matchups. Um, outside of that, though, I didn't test too many other things. Uh, a lot of the other side spam core teams that I've had before have ran like Arm Rouge. Arm Rouge didn't fit too well on this, I didn't really like in the metagame. Um, other than that, I ran another Iron Crown team previously at one of my Southern California locals, and it was a similar Iron Crown team, but it didn't have a Trick Room mode. It had a Landris Eye instead of the Ursaluna. In Sin, instead of Iron Moss, it played more like a balance score, and that felt good, but I've always been like, Trick Room always feels really good, and I was like, Iron Moth, that sounds fun. I don't think anybody's going to be prepped for it. So that's how the team uh, so far came up. Yeah, uh, and then so... From there, I guess, talk me through the uh, the Pokemon and how you, uh, why you decided to train each of your Pokemon the way that you did. Yeah, so we'll start off with the Ndidi. The Ndidi is pretty standard. I've been running max, max defense and HP on the Ndidi with four in special defense. 
I had a buddy of mine talk to me, I think the day before, or two days before the tournament, and he said, you should put 20 special defense with the Psychic Seed, you can live a Terra Normal Blood Moon uh, attack. So I was like, that sounds like a pretty good idea. I'll keep that. Um, Crown, I played this team at a NorCal local the weekend before Vancouver, and it felt really good, but the Crown... I felt like I missed a little bit of damage calcs, so I had a little bit of bulk previously. And I'm like, max speed's a guaranteed. Outspeed's the adamant Urshifu's going around. Um, and I felt like sometimes I miss out on Tachyon KOs for the Urshifu Darkstar investing a little bit of special defense investment. So I just said, all right, I, it doesn't, it's doesn't. it got decent natural bulk to begin with. I don't think I'm going to invest anything. We'll just go max, max, and then have the fours everywhere else. Um, the Gallade is very similar to my other guy from Portland. I didn't think I really need as much physical defense, so I had a little bit of attack investment. Since Gallade's special defense stat is so good, you don't really need to invest in it. The Iron Moth, it was bulkier before, um, but I thought, because I had originally not much speed investment, I had like a two, it's still a lot, like 196 or something like that speed investment, but I felt like... Uh, ogre pawns were speed creeping to speed creep the other ogre pawns, and since it shares the same stat point, I thought we'll just speed tie the max speed ogre pawns and go from there. So I just went max max. The bolt's not good enough to invest in. You won't live any attacks with its poor special def or physical defense and HP stat. So I just went max max with that and just left it alone. Uh, the Ursaluna, it's had a little bit of changes between. Um, Portland and Vancouver. Portland, it was max special defense because Raging Bolt was literally everywhere. I was not dealing with the uh, either Life Orb or Booster Energy Draco Meteors coming into my Arsena. People expecting it to knock out. So I thought we'll take some special defense out because I don't need it as much anymore. Add a little bit of HP investment and then more attacks since I did uh, miss out on some knockouts previously that I did start to pick up nowadays with the more attack investment. And then the Ogre Pawn was the last thing. And I thought, Ogre Pawn, it feels good to run max speed. But that's more if you just want to run more offensive and not have too much of a support move pool. And then if you're running more of a supportive one with a lot of speed investment, you miss out on so many damage KOs that I thought, might as well keep the same one I've been running pretty similar. The speed investment was uh, intentional. It did outspeed Modest Glamora, so I could IV cudgel it whenever I needed to be. Um, but the HP uh, and the defense investment was really nice to uh, live some wicked blows and stuff and uh, use follow me as a more of a utility in case I didn't need to go on the offensive. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and so, you know, some of these Pokemon, uh, I, I guess you've, you've been using for a little bit, but are not so intuitive to me. So, for example, Gallade is not a Pokemon that I have ever even really considered using. Uh, tell me about... So, and so I, I'm curious about really all the choices. Um, so, you're running Clear Amulet on it, you're running Terra Grass on it, um, and then uh, the, the four moves that you're running on it, Trick Room, Wide Guard, Psycho Cut, and Sacred Sword, are the two stabs, and then two of the better support moves. But um, are there any other considerations as far as move pools or items or Terra types? So, I felt like this is probably the best Gallade set that you can run at the moment. Um, there is an argument of wide guard versus upper hand if you are having a rough time with um, fake out spam under trick room with a terrain change from here and there. Um, but I've always felt that wide guard helps so much with rock slide spam, dazzling gleam, like choice specs flutter mains can't go for dazzling gleam because then I could just wide guard it afterwards. Um, earthquakes like opposing Ursalunas. Um, that only have two stabs with uh, Facade and Earthquake, you can wide guard that and basically with a Ghost or Saluna of yourself, they can't hit you at that point. So you have the upper advantage in that matchup. And there are some other moves you can run. I've seen Aqua Cutter, Leaf Blade, but I feel like Galley's only really there for two reasons, uh, or three technically. Uh, one to set up Trick Room, one more to be a wide guard support Mon if it's needed, and then um, to do massive damage to like Incineroar, Amoongus, Outside of that, it doesn't really need to be uh, doing anything else. Uh, the Grass Terra was really helpful, and this was back even in Portland as well. I was not too much of a fan of playing, as most people are, against Dondozo. Especially since you are trying to sweep under Trick Room in five turns majority of the time when I was playing Hard Trick Room before. And even if I have a Trick Room mode with the Gallade, you want to sweep in five, six turns maximum. 
So Grass Terra let me live the Wave Crash from Don Dozo, the Earthquake from Don Dozo, and it also lets you be immune to the Amoongus. So uh, ignoring Amoongus and Sacred Sorting, potentially the Incineroar on the other slot, or Psycho Cutting the Amoongus and getting rid of it, it was just a super nice addition to a uh, Psychic Spam score that I really didn't have too much uh, practice with before until uh, Brian Collins actually gave me the idea for it. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it obviously is putting to work uh, the last couple of events for you. Uh, and then the other Pokemon that obviously is a little more strange, haven't seen as much of, is the uh, Iron Moth. Uh, and so you're running the Power Herb set. Uh, again, Terra Grass, and then Meteor Beam, Heat Wave, Sludge Wave. Uh, and so uh, I guess, talk to me. Was that, again, Iron Moth, not a Pokemon that really saw play outside of, I think, uh, at NAIC uh, last year where Justin got top eight with it. So this is the second real finish that I've seen with it. Um, why Why these moves? Why this item? Tell me about this This Pokemon. What does it do? So, I did get the idea still from the Japanese team, and it was a really interesting idea of if you can get Iron Moth plus Iron Crown next to each other, having two crazy moves of Expanding Force and Sludge Wave, it's hard to resist a lot of those besides maybe Steel types, which Heat Wave still comes into play. Um, my one issue, and I've always had this issue playing a lot of uh, teams that need to sweep in four or five turns, is Accuracy. So originally, my side spam team for Portland had a lot of had no moves that could miss. So it was all coming up to hopefully I just make the right plays at the right time, make the right reads. Moth does have some inaccuracies, especially with three or two of the moves, and then Sludge Wave's guaranteed, but you also hit your own Pokemon. Um, Meteor Beam felt really good to hit Incineroars because Incin being the most used Pokemon, I believe, in day two of Vancouver definitely helped out a lot. Um, Heat Wave. I, Fiery Dance is nice, yes, but I feel like that's more of a booster energy kind of set for it. So um, having the plus one Heat Wave can do a lot of damage to the majority of the metagame. That Sludge Wave is not hitting, and then Sludge Wave being very nice uh, next to Iron Crown um, is just basically consistent, especially since it doesn't get another poison move outside of Acid Spray. And Acid Spray's base damage is really nothing, so I just went with Sludge Wave at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and then this is, again, this is a team that I think operates on a very different axis than what uh, a lot of people are familiar with. So if someone wanted to pick up this team and try it out, can you talk me through uh, a little bit about how to play, maybe some tips and tricks to playing this sort of team? Yeah, so a lot of side spam teams, especially the Trick Room ones, are so oriented on set of Trick Room and sweep from there. And this team plays, I think, almost completely different than a normal side spam, uh, side spam team does. Um, whenever I'm playing this team, I always think about the two different modes that I have the options to play. I have the Indeedee plus either Iron Moth or Crown Lead, so I can play if I'm having a faster uh, speed control, or a playing against like a balanced team, for example. Uh, Iron Moth plus Wellspring, or even Crown plus Wellspring, or uh, one of the Fast Sweepers plus Redirection is super nice to get your boost and then start being especially with Ndidi potentially in the back. I've had a lot of games where they would lead Incineroar on lead and have Iron Moth and either Ndidi or Ogron, and you just threaten so much damage turn one that it makes it an amazing setup sweeper. The only reason you wouldn't bring Moth is if you're playing against more Tailwind-oriented teams. Um, it's hard to get that... Um, Meteor Beam and start sweeping, especially if they have more speed control, since we don't have a Tailwind... Uh, speed control like some of the crown teams do previously. Um, the trick room mode, um, I remember I saw one of the videos uh, you guys had with Michael Zang saying this team plays similar to a soft room, and he's pretty right on that part. Um, the iron crown can be used under trick room, but majority of the time likes to be out of it. And you only really bring um, the trick room mode if you think your crown moth mode can't really sweep in time. So, tri tricks I would think of, if you're playing this team, uh, first look at your opposing team and think, alright, what speed control do they have? Do they have a good Trick Room mode? Do they have a good Tailwind mode? Are their balanced Pokemon faster than your balanced Pokemon? And from there, deviate on, alright, if I have enough redirection control, uh, can Crown win the game without any speed control? Or if they're like, alright, they're too fast, you can set up Trick Room with Gallade and go from there. That would be my, like, guarantee tricks because it's not I wouldn't say this is an easy team to pick up but also it can be pretty uh, 
uh, straightforward if you just call the leads correct, which is basically how Sai Spam Vesori played past uh, probably three or four edge relations, I would say. Yeah, uh, for sure. And then are there any matchups that, or any Pokemon that you see in Team Preview where you have to sort of rad radically change the way that you play or any, you have specific game plans for certain teams or specific Pokemon? Um, yeah, so opposing Sai Spam... Uh, Normally, the, a lot of times we're exposing side spam, you don't bring the Ndidi. I feel like it's a game of chicken a lot of the times where you don't really want to bring your Ndidi because if they don't bring it, you give them terrain. If you if they bring it, then you get terrain. So it's like you're playing chicken a lot of the time in that matchup. And then Wygaard's super nice with Gallade, and you could even go like Moth plus Crown mode to potentially deny Trick Room. And if they do get Trick Room up, Ursaluna is great under Trick Room as long as it isn't the Torkoal. Um... For other team compositions that I have played, one hard matchup I did have, uh, actually two. John Mark was running a uh, balance with, um, I believe it was Gouging Fire and King Gambit. Uh, that team had a lot of um, hard matchups for this team in particular, just because uh, the Moth, even though it's supposed to be really good, the King Gambit it with AV just takes too many hits. Um, and then the Landers is a really big, big problem for the Moth and the uh, Crown, since you don't you you have to Terra always to resist any of its attacks, and it's still just too much damage where the rest of the Pokemon can come into play. So Trick Room was probably the best way you can play against this thing. Um, Gallade plus Ursaluna was really like solid of a matchup, but then you just have to call the Protects every turn, and it just becomes like, all right, if you can't sweep in five turns, what's your board position afterwards? So, this team would be probably one of your hardest matchups, I would say. Um, and then, like, another Roaring Moon balance team. Uh, Scott's team was really rough as well. Because um, the Moon hits, f I think, five Pokemon on my side for super effective damage with Acrobatics plus Knockoff. So, you have to deal with it, but you also got to remember, all right, what speed tier is the Moon? Can you outspeed it with your... Um, with your... Not your Moon. Or not your... Uh, with the Moth. The Moth is like a really good game plan, but if it doesn't outspeed, then you have to readjust and play a little differently than how you did before. So those two matchups, like a really hard, like double dark balance teams. Uh, the Ting Lu team I did face once, which wasn't too hard, but um, playing Ga Gallade into that is also a really good idea. Yeah, I could see that. Um, and yeah, so I guess... With that, uh, is there anything else you want to talk about with respect to the team itself, or do you want to move on to your tournament experience? Uh, one more thing I will say. Uh, you do have to be really bold playing this team. Uh, a lot of uh, turns I've had to make a lot of hard reads on either helping hand plays, doubling into a slot, earthquaking my own self has been a play, like Terra Grass Gallade plus Earthquake, so you have Sacred Sword or Psycho Cut plus Earthquake to knock out things it does really do come into play. I think one turn, I think, even back in Portland, I earthquaked my own Hatterene to get the damage to potentially pick up a knockout. And that one, that changed the game a little bit. But uh, being bold and making these hard plays that normally you wouldn't want to make, but when you're playing side spin, you are the aggressor. You don't want to play reactionary because if you're on the back foot, you're not. you're in a bad spot to begin with. So making sure that you have either good board position would be number one, but two is also you got to make a lot of bold plays, and you're you're trying to win in five six turns. You're not trying to drag this thing on twelve thirteen turns. And if you are, then it's just like hopefully you just get the crit or something at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to add to that, I mean, you said you uh, you know one of your matchups, you felt like you were calling for text, uh a lot of the time, and I feel like that's. One of those things where experience really helps or practice really helps where if you do have to make those hard reads or you do have to do things like, you know, earthquake yourself or uh, re read to protect uh, a couple turns in a row, uh, having all that experience playing the team, I think, uh, gives you a better insight into player tendencies when they're in that spot. Oh, definitely, yes. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, I, that's really the secret, right? It's just you got to practice, 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 and then, then, uh, and then you get to read the results like you've been doing over the last uh, couple months. Right, and also, it was funny that you say practice. Uh, the week leading up to Vancouver, after I played the local NorCal, I didn't play Pokemon for the entire week. I thought, I did the same thing in Portland, too, where I'm like, all right, I'm going to take the week off. I'm not going to stress myself out. I've been playing this archetype for so long that really all I'd be doing is learning calcs and stuff, which I can do the night before at that point. So as long as you know your team, if 
as long as you have a good feel of how it plays and you've practiced it enough, instinct will take over. You just know your calcs by just playing the team so much that, yes, there will be some hard times where you do have to make those calls, but you'll know when to make those hard calls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... With that, let's talk about your tournament experience uh, itself. You went um, you went 8-1 in day one. Of course, got all the way to top eight for losing to Scott. Talk to me about uh, your experience in day one. In day one or in day two? Uh, we can start with day one. Did um, well, I'll go with the day one start. Uh, day one was very interesting um i did play some very interesting teams i know the g round two looks really wild to begin with vj's team of uh umbreon and then sylveon and stuff was a very fun matchup that uh brought me back to when i played him in fresno and he had a very similar team um this team looked very scary on paper but it was clean 2-0 for the most part um the miascarada not killing the indeedy with a stellar knockoff was very surprising to me um, and then the Terra Ground Inkaton almost swept my team in game one because it knocked out my Moth, knocked out the Crown, and I was like, wow, this thing is doing a lot of work. It's kind of scary. And then Yan and Brian put in a lot of work as well. Um, but this one felt like a pretty solid matchup. Um, my round four against another SoCal player in Shane, uh, which I did play in Portland as well, uh, this team felt solid on paper if I was playing the old team. My new team of Iron Crown doesn't really do amazing into Chen Pao, King Gambit, and the Ogre on Hearth Flame, so that was a really rough matchup. Uh, he it came it came close game one, and then game two he just made all the right reads and swept my team. So I was like, it sucks to lose, but if you're losing to a homie, hopefully his run does well as well. So it, it, friendly fire, but it was really close. And I had a pretty interesting. Up, especially because the King Gamma with Black Glasses just does so much damage. Um, another one was uh, round 8 when I played Geo, another SoCal player that play at the locals all the time. Uh, this one felt pretty good, especially because his teams before didn't have the Whimsicott. It had a Dark Urshifu, which made the side spam matchup a little bit harder. But since he had um, the Whimsicott, the Whimsicott can't do anything against Psychic Terrain. Perigraph seems solid on paper, but like he doesn't really want to take too much damage turn one or turn two. So it, it, you're really just limited to Goldango, Ogre Pond Water, Fluttermane, and Instant, and Iron Moth just had a really good game here. Uh, potential Meteor Beams, and then just Heat Waves and Sludge Waves just swept through uh, this team. Um, but outside of that, my day one was pretty good. Expanding Force. Uh, it didn't click as much, surprisingly. I didn't I only had, I think, one game of my entire 15 rounds where I clicked Expanding Force and Sludge Wave next to each other, <laughs> which the, the team's better if you do have the two next to each other, but it just never came to be. The, the opponents were still just too good to um, play into that. Mm -hmm. So going into day two, um, I was feeling pretty confident. Uh, a lot of the teams were very um, not really Tailwind heavy, which was nice, so I could play a little bit of a different matchup. So uh, my round 10 was really close, lost in three on a three-turn sleep plus crit, but he played extremely well in the other two games. So I can't complain. He played really well. He's like, man, I feel sorry. I'm like, don't feel sorry. Crits happen. I don't mind it at all. It would be nice to go 9-1 and then have a really good chance for uh, top cut afterwards, but it just means I just got to win more games afterwards. So that game was really close. Carl was the Ting Lu. I didn't expect too much. I know there was, I think, one or two Ting Lu dozos coming into play. And I was like, I don't really have much experience into this. Let's just bring Gallade and see what happens. And Gallade was just phenomenal. Uh, and then I think I called that he wouldn't bring the Ting Lu or stuff game two. And Moth just swept the team afterwards. So that one felt like a really good matchup. Um, Jean-Marc, we explained before, was a really hard matchup. And he made some really great calls um, in that round 12. Um, uh, not protecting a lot of the time in my trick room turns was really interesting, but if you're playing against a team that you want to be on the back foot, you can just make a lot of aggressive reads, and just if they don't expect it, you just win the game from there. So he played phenomenal. I can't complain. And then my uh, very fun matchup against uh, Aaron Trailer on stream uh, yeah. was not... Uh, 
expecting to go on stream and I saw this matchup. I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, and so you had one of the uh, the strangest plays I've seen uh, in your round 13 matchup against Aaron in game two. You went for Terra Grass on your Gallade uh, and immediately knocked itself out with your own Sludge Wave. Uh, talk me through what happened in that moment. So I was ba so back and forth on this play. Um, yes, it was not a timeout. I didn't timeout because you can't Terra if you timeout. Um, so I went for the sludge wave, unfortunately. I was like, if he tailwinds, I can just set up a trick room. Unfortunately, he didn't tailwind in. Well, Scott had the amazing uh, call of, that was the worst terrestrialization I've ever heard. <laughs> and he was completely right on that. Uh, seeing my galley go down, I'm like, all right, go into the game three, let's see what happens. But yeah, Bleak when Storm connects, I still don't even know if I live the choice band. Surging strikes, even if I tear grass because Glade's defense is so low. But it would have gave me a fighting shot potentially for game two. But I was like, let's just make this play, see what happens. Even if I shouldn't have teared anyway. But seeing that play, I was like, wow, I have probably one of my favorite plays of the regulation on the Terra Stellar Urshifu at Portland. And now I have the worst play of the regulation of the Sledge Wave on the Gallade. So it was a very uh, funny uh, game two, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a funny game too, but you did end up winning the set, so uh, it worked out in the end. You won game one and you won game three. Uh, honestly, very very impressive. Not to get like tilted in that moment. I mean, I I'm how, how are you feeling? How are you feeling going after that game two? Uh, after the game two, I was like, wow. I well, the meteor beam miss was like, all right, it is what it is. I gotta play better than that, not rely on that. But also, I was supposed to bring the crown, and I don't know why I brought the crown, because the ga the, having the crown plus the side spam, if I knock out the torn, if he doesn't tailwind, does really well into the rest of his Pokemon. So that was a big mistake on my part of, let's say the Tornadus goes down, there's no tailwind. Expanding force plus Sludge Wave just has a really good matchup afterwards. Um, so definitely was not a amazing play, and then obviously the Sludge <laughs> Wave came up. But I was like... I played really well game one. I got a little lucky with the critical hit from the Ivy Cudgel. But knowing that my damage calcs of the Incineroar and Terror Blast, I was like, I have a good feeling what he's going to do game three, so I'll just play to my best ability. And I'm like, I've gotten this far. That one Sludge Wave is super funny, but it's not going to decide my entire tournament, especially on game three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, like you said, you ended up winning the uh, that, that round, uh, putting yourself in a win in a situation. Uh, so yeah, tell me about the... Uh... Uh, the the winning in. So, uh, Rafi played another buddy of mine from SoCal, Aaron Brock, at the end of day one, I believe. And I was remembering how he played because he played it really slow and passive a lot with the Ursaluna. He always led the Ursaluna, which I thought was very interesting since my crown mode is really strong into a lot of his team outside of the Insin and the Cresselia, just damage wise. So. It felt like, yeah, I did have to make some reads here and there, but it did feel like a really good matchup because the Ogre Pawn plus the Crown looks really good into the rest of his team. And then if he does want to set up Trick Room, he has no headlong rush on his Ursaluna, so I should win the Ursaluna 1v1 at the end of the day. And then going back to Gallade with Wide Guard, does really well. I mean, Earthquake, he can that means he has to rely so much on Facade at that point. And... If you're relying on Facade, that means my Ursaluna just has the Headlong Rush advantage at that point. And if he ha if he Terror Ghost, then my my Incineroar has Knock Off. So it felt like a really good matchup, and I just had really good leads the entire uh, Game 1 and Game 2 to finish out uh, Day 2. Yeah, and that secured your way into the Top 8, where, of course, you played Scott. And you talked a little bit about this earlier, but yeah, tell me a little bit about what happened here. So Scott's team was very interesting. Um, I've played very similar. Another SoCal player plays a very similar team, but there was no Roaring Moon before. There was a uh, Urshifu Water, and the Urshifu Water is much easier because it's not a dark type. I have a better chance of expanding force and things like that from that nature. The Moon, so his team had a lot of very intriguing uh, mentions. I know he mentioned it in his team report, which was phenomenal. Um, I remember seeing his gold. His Goldango was really slow because I saw his instant out speed under Tricker. I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. Um, so fast instant was really surprising. Um, the Goldango was very bulky, but also very offense because the Metal Coat uh, plus Make It Rain does do a lot of damage. So I do remember my game one. I did go with the Trick Room mode to see how it would do. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't make the re the right calls game one. Um, I, he did give me a chance to just Sacred Sword as Moon turn one instead of setting up Trick Room. 
because I do live the knockout with knockoff with Ndidi since its item is consumed. Um, that was a very interesting point where I could just knocked it out and then played reactionary from there. But then it feels like I don't guarantee Trick Room. The Lander is right next to it, or the Goldengo gets a nasty plot boost, and I got to deal with nasty plot boosted Goldengo. It felt a little weird. So uh, the Trick Room mode, even though I did set it up, I just didn't sweep it fast enough in those five turns and then he just had the advantage afterwards where the moon either the moon was still living or the gold go both of them are set up and they can just sweep afterwards um and then game two comes around and i'm like all right i don't really know if my trick remote can sweep fast enough so let's try and go with my iron moth mode since crown doesn't seem amazing as a lead since lander is and moon both outspeed it uh so i was like all right and then if crowns there Goldengo would just set up for free it's like terror boss is not doing that much damage and then it's like then i'm wasting my terror and then i have to cut uh play catch up so i was like all right let's lead the moth and see what happens and i saw he i remember his lead of roaring moon plus Goldengo, and i'm like all right i feel really confident of just going helping hand it's really risky but it's the play i always make a lot of the time if i just want to go for the risky play of helping hand meteor bream and trying to knock out the roaring moon and i remember turn one so well because i go for the helping hand and then i see the knockoff go first and i'm like oh no this is not good at all and then he knocks off the iron moth the one shots and i'm like all right that's game <laughs> over um, i can't come back from that and especially because the gold angle sitting next to it setting up a nasty plot i'm like yeah, you got the Scott. Good luck in round four. Uh, this is where my moth journey ends at this point. But um, the matchup definitely did feel very uh, rough, and not knowing his speed tiers and stuff until when I tried doing these game plans uh, definitely um, hindered my uh, uh, matchup, definitely, for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, despite that, you got all the way to top eight, so still a really, really good show, even though, you know, I saw the, the matchup against Zach, the set matchup against Scott, maybe one of the rougher matchups. So it's a little unfortunate that you had to queue into that in top cut. But uh, but yeah, a really, really strong run, especially I'm looking at that day one schedule. You didn't even talk about some of the, the, the crazy good players that you had to fight through in day one, not to mention day two. So a really, really impressive run. Um, and yeah, uh, definitely recommend that you try out the team. I think it's one of the cooler teams uh, to come out of Vancouver, the Iron Moth always. Uh, I, I love Iron Moth. It's personally one of my favorite uh paradox pokemon so i'm always glad to see it do uh do really well um so brandon uh so uh size fam are you going to continue your size fam journey in regulation g we just got the rule set this week so it feels like an obliga obligation at this point especially because i think i made a tweet on all right let's do size fam for reg g let's see what happens uh, but that requires either shadow rider which sounds fun in theory but um it doesn't really allow for a trick mode, which is a lot of the time which I like to do. And um, also, playing speed ties with max speed Caloric Shadow Riders does not sound like a fun time. So, uh, we'll see what the journey is. I am also the notable advisor for Garatina, even though it's probably the worst restricted you can <laughs> use in a restricted format. Uh, we'll try and make the boy work. We tried it in Sword and Shield, we'll try it in Scarlet and Violet, but... We'll see if I take it to any uh, more regionals afterwards. Yeah, are you planning on going to any more regionals after this? Uh, only regional I am planning to go to is LA since it is close to home. Luckily, the West Coast regionals does make it easier. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully, uh, hopefully we go to Worlds because I definitely want to see uh, if it's still Hawaii, wherever the announcement <laughs> is afterwards. But uh, definitely uh, could see Size Spam, could see Garatina, could see anything that's unorthodox because that's how i like to play a lot of the time yeah well I, I always enjoy seeing what you've cooked up it's always really fun to see and then you seem to keep doing well with it so uh yeah i'm looking forward to, to see what you cook up in regulation g already giratina regulation giratina that's that's, that's what it's for right <laughs> right uh, <laughs> um but yeah so thank you for coming on the channel and talking about your team i really appreciate it because this is again a team that i have not used anything like this before so hearing about how you use it how you think about it was really really insightful to me uh did you have any final words or shout outs that you wanted to give um, final words, I, I would say tr definitely give this team a try. It's definitely a very fun, uh, unorthodox team that does allow you to play more aggressive. A lot of teams in this metagame feel very reactionary or very set up or dependent or something like that. So this one definitely is more fun or, uh, aggressive base, which is always fun to play. 
And then uh, shout outs. I would just shout out all the homies, especially the SoCal homies, definitely giving me great practice with some unorthodox teams to play against. And then uh, anybody that anybody they know themselves that helped me team build here and there. It's definitely a uh, great time. And I wouldn't have built this team perfectly if it weren't for them. So, yeah. Well, thank you again for coming on the channel and congratulations again on your incredible run at uh, Vancouver Regionals. And uh, with that, uh, until next time, I will see you all later.